Hi everyone, uh, Jason here from spiritualbabies.net. You've joined us for a series on Jonah. We're joined by Rabbi Neely, is over there in um, Florida. You've seen, I'm sure, many of uh, his videos that we've done before. There's going to be a link to his channel on top of the page there. And we're going to go through this uh, book in three or four shows. Thank you for joining us, Rabbi, on this um, journey through Jonah, or Yona. <laughs> Looking forward to it. Um, we're just going to jump straight in. Um, chapter one, verse one. And as we get to some of the kind of key points uh, about who and where they are, I'll stop and we can talk about that. Um, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and proclaim against it, for their evil has come before me. So at this point, we should talk a little bit about Jonah, I think, uh, who he was, who his father was, because they name, is there any other reference to Jonah's father in the text? Uh, well, there is reference to to uh, the idea of, of the Zamitai elsewhere. So we do also hear about a, um, a, a person named Jonah in the Book of Kings, uh, second Book of Kings, uh, it's chapter 14, uh, who is also called the son of Amitai and is also referred to as a prophet. So there's definitely a tradition that, the, that this person and that person are the same, but there are also other commentators who wonder whether or not it's a similar name but different person. Um, the, the question is exactly when is this story taking place? The, the general consensus uh, is that this is probably taking place uh, after the rise of Nineveh, which is the, the kingdom of Assyria, uh, but before its uh, attack onto the Jewish people. So it is a proto-opponent. It is a growing power within the area um, it is likely to become a challenge and eventually a major threat to the people of Israel, but it has not yet reached that uh, that level. And and that may explain part of why Jonah behaves the way he does. Um, so uh, Nineveh, part of Assyria, I think today is, is a modern day Iraq? Yes, exactly. It's, it's in the Iraq-Syrian uh, border region. Do we know what Nineveh means? Uh, no, uh, okay. I, I, we, don't, we don't know exactly what Nineveh means. Uh, one thing that is interesting to point out, however, is that one of the inscriptional, inscriptional, inscribed, I don't know what the, uh, the adjective would be, one of the symbols used in inscriptions relating to the city of Nineveh is a fish. Oh. So that may play a part um, in our story of, uh, of Jonah, but hmm. I think we'll have more to say about that when we get to chapter two. So Jonah is uh, a, a regular guy up until this point, we have to assume, and he has a message from the creator that he has to go off to a foreign city in a foreign land. And... Uh, I'll, I'll back you up there just okay. a second. At least, at least according to the, the commentary that reads him as being a continuing prophet is that he has had other prophecies as well. Oh, okay. um, this is not his uh, first rodeo, so to speak. Uh, and in fact, he has prophesied uh, destruction before which was averted according uh, to the tradition by Chuva, by people repenting. And he may even have then a bit of a stigma of having made a false prophecy. Um, even though we, the reader, know that when you make a prophecy that is contingent upon behavior, if the behavior changes, the prophecy is indeed annulled, mm. uh, if it's for destruction, then that's the good thing, that's a successful prophecy. He may be a little bit burnt by, by having people say, yeah, well, you've told us the things were going to happen before, and they didn't. I didn't know uh, that, and that makes perfect sense. Uh, again, uh, feeding into why he may be uh, a little bit less enthusiastic about his mission. And in three, uh, and Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish before, from before the Lord, and went down to Joppa, found a ship uh, going to Tarshish, paid its hire, and went down into it, to come with them to Tarshish from before the Lord. So it's interesting that I think is Tarshish in Wales. Does uh, it's Wales? That's so funny. What a what a that mistake. would be, that would be cool. But <laughs> yeah, went straight to straight to Wales. Um, in Spain, that's where's where, where where I wanted to go. Is is there a relationship? Because I think um, uh, I think I read that Tarshish either means kind of far in the sea or the sea, and somewhere I read Spain. Right. Uh, you're right on all accounts, okay. which is to say Tarshish is not a place that is singularly identified by all sources. Um, the, the coast of Spain, the Mediterranean coast of Spain, is indeed one of the most common explanations. 
Um, but in general, it seems to be, whether it's that far uh, edge of the Mediterranean or not, meant to be way, 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 way across the sea. Uh, so, so it's definitely um, not nearby, and it is most definitely not the route to get to Nineveh. The, the one thing we know about going to Nineveh from the land of Israel is you don't need a boat. Mm. Uh, it, it is you are using the wrong mode of transportation and absolutely moving in the wrong direction. And I have to ask, uh, why on earth did Jonah think that he could get on the boat um, and escape his God, like like the, his God was only associated with that piece of land. He's going to get on the boat and leave, and God's going to kind of go, oh, where did he go? I can't see him anymore. <laughs> right. just... Well, clearly Jonah doesn't think that, uh, because when he is confronted by the sailors, he explain, explains that, yeah, God is everywhere, and God is the, the master mm -hmm. of the world. So he's, he's not fleeing from God in the sense that he is trying to hide, um, uh, you know, a la Adam and Eve, uh, who didn't know any better. Uh, he is fleeing from before God, which means from from God's task. He is fleeing from the the, the job that he's been given by God. It's kind of and, like when uh, there's a, a whole row of people and and someone asks for a volunteer, and everyone else takes a step back. And he was <laughs> he was maybe taking a step back to reduce his availability to do that task. Exactly right. I mean, he is he's rejecting the the mission. He he's not saying that God can't punish him for this. He's not saying that God won't um, stop him from this. But one of the things that's really interesting in this is that Jonah is saying very categorically uh, something that Judaism believes very strongly, which is God does not compel us to be righteous or wicked. God has given him this task, and no, Joah, Jonah still has within his own free will the, the right to refuse to do what God is asking. That doesn't mean that God can't be angry. It doesn't mean that God can't punish. It doesn't mean that God can't try to convince him further, which is going to happen. Um, but it does mean that if he goes the wrong way, then what God wanted to happen in Nineveh through Jonah is not going to happen through Jonah. It, it, it's that, that God is not going to reach down like a puppet master and suddenly pull the strings and, and make Jonah go right back to where he wants him to go. So he is not fleeing from God to hide. He's fleeing from God to avoid doing the job that he's been asked. Now the Lord cast a mighty wind into the sea and there was a mighty tempest on the sea and the ship threatened to be broken up and the sailors were frightened and each one cried out to his God uh, and they cast the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them and Jonah went down into the ship's hold and lay down and fell fast asleep. I love that that picture. First of all, all of the sailors, different gods, and working together. There's a there's a picture of how the world could be. Um, and Jonah, not at all worried about this, apparently, going down and and just falling asleep on the floor. Now they do I, say I, that I, a lot of sleep is a sign of depression, but that seems <laughs> to me a little bit above and beyond. So it's it's not that I would say that he's not worried about it. Um, it's this this verse beautifully contrasts um, the the sailors with Jonah and their behavior. The sailors, though they are though they are idolaters and believe in their various pantheons, they're pious. Mm. Uh, when there's a catastrophe, when there is a, a disaster facing them, a crisis, they are praying. They are reaching out to to spiritual um, support. Jonah, on the other hand is not now is it not it's not because jonah doesn't believe in god i mean more than the sailors jonah knows god is real you know whatever they're praying to we know isn't real because you know we we're, we know better than the sailors unfortunately about their their religious uh, the worth of their uh, idols and jonah knows that what they're doing is pointless and jonah knows that he could pray to a real god and, and a, you know god that can actually do something and he is choosing not to and he is choosing not to in a way that really underscores exactly why he's not going to Nineveh. So we might want to rehash some of the reasons why he's not going to Nineveh. One, mm -hmm. one of the reasons is given traditionally is that if this is at the, the rising of Nineveh's power and if Jonah is a prophet, Jonah is probably able to figure out Nineveh is going to be a threat, if not a destructive force, to the land of Israel, as indeed it eventually is when it destroys the northern kingdom of Israel. Why should he be part of an effort to save Nineveh and spare it from God's wrath now before it has done harm, which would only preserve it to do harm later. So he may be looking in the long term and saying, look, 
sure, the Ninevites right now, they're still deserving of God's compassion, but Ninevites eventually are going to be horrible, a horrible empire, and they're going to bring destruction on my people. Therefore, they don't deserve my help. So I'm just going to remove the help that I could have given to them. I'm not going to destroy them. I'm just going to refrain from saving them. So that may be one reason why he wants to go to, to Tarshish rather than Nineveh. The other reason may simply be that he de believes they deserve it. He doesn't believe that people should be allowed to repent and avoid the punishment for the crimes that they've committed. If they have committed a crime that is worthy of destruction, why should God give them a second chance? And with that, he seems to be remarkably and, and uncharacteristically for a human, um, not hypocritical. Mm. And that's why he's going down to sleep because he is willing to accept that this storm is because of his mistake and he deserves it. Therefore, he's gonna go lay down and go to sleep and he expects to die because he deserves it. He has abandoned God's mission the punishment should be death. And he's not going to fight that. He's not going to argue. He's not going to break down and suddenly say, oh, God, I'm so sorry. Now that I see that you're going to destroy me, I'm going to be so sorry that I rejected you. No, he is a man of justice. Right? I, I have defied God. I deserve the punishment. And he is laying down to accept that punishment right now because that's what he expects to happen to Nineveh. So he is being very stalwart and strong in his defense of justice over compassion. Um, which, again, is contrasted with the sailors who, when something bad happens, they don't immediately start wondering what justice is this. They immediately just pray for compassion and mercy. Uh, they're going to get to the justice in a minute, and they're still going to want compassion and mercy. Uh, again, contrasting to Jonah. Um, I have to ask, I mean, I'm here as a non-Jewish person looking at this text, and I have to wonder, um, what did Nineveh do? B, how do they know that they have to, I mean, if someone runs up to you in the street and says, you're doing it wrong and slaps you around the face, <laughs> then gives you a ticket to, uh, for a fine and you're not aware of the law, um, that doesn't seem kind of fair. So, I mean, how do we, do we, we don't really know, do we, what Nineveh's done wrong or how do they know? I mean, other than the fact that Jonah's going to turn up, because that must be on his mind as well. He's going to turn up in a foreign land. Uh, giving a proclamation from a foreign god saying you need to change a way that we don't know um, and repent or you're um, you know you're going to suffer wrath and hellfire and um... so, let's leave that as a uh, cliffhanger for okay. chapter three fair enough okay when we get to chapter three that's that's going to be the first few verses of why are they listening to him hmm. um, and, and I think that would be a, a better place for the discussion but his worry that he might not be believed was also considered by many commentators to be an additional reason why he fled. Okay, six. And the captain approached him and said to him, Why do you sleep? Get up. Call out to your God. Perhaps God will think about us and we will not perish. And they said each to his fellow, Come, let us cast lots so that we will know because of whom this evil has befallen us. And they cast lots and the lot fell upon Jonah. It's one of the few places in the, in the Tanakh that lots uh, pop up. The only one that springs immediately to mind is the um, goats at Yom Kippur when they cast right. lots for the uh, the goat that goes out to Israel and the goat of um, the goat of the Lord. And not coincidentally, um, the Book of Jonah is read in the afternoon of Yom Kippur. Segway. Um, okay, and they say to him, and they said to him. Tell us now, because of whom has this evil befallen us? What is your work, and whence do you come? What is your land, and from what people are you? That's four questions. <laughs> um, and he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. And he manages to answer all of them pretty much with um, one sentence. Pretty good. Uh, well, he doesn't say the one that is actually most important, which is what are you doing? Mm. Right? What, what's your business? What, what, what's your job? Right? Uh, right? What is your, your work? Um, that's the one that he leaves out. Uh, now, it's implied in verse 10 that he does eventually give that information. But because it comes in verse 10, not in verse 9, there, there's probably some additional exchange not recounted where 
the sailors have to get that out of him because he doesn't seem to just volunteer it all on his own. Mm. Um, but notice that although they are able through their limited lot system to divine who it is that's sort of the, the nexus of this problem, they still need him to fill in the blanks, which he willingly does. Right? He doesn't say, nothing to do with me. I don't know what this is. The, you know, your lots are random. I mean, who cares what you know, number you pull out of a hat and straw, short straw, long straw, right? He doesn't answer to say that this is pointless and, and ridiculous. He answers by saying, yep, that's right. It's me. You got me. Again, true to form, he, he's not hiding from his crimes. And the men were very frightened and they said to him, what is it that, that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from before the Lord because he had told them. And they said to him, what shall we do with you so that the sea subsides from upon us since the sea is becoming stormier? And he said to them, pick me up and cast me into the sea so that the sea may subside from upon you. For I know that because of me, the mighty tempest is upon you. And the men rode vigorously to return to dry land, um, but they could not, for the sea was becoming stormier upon them. Oh, All so right, they so tried, right? They tried first to not throw him in. They, they wanted exactly. to see if they could figure it out, right? He says, I deserve to, chuck, to be chucked into the ocean, right? That's the only thing that's going to save you is my death. And these pagan sailors who are used to pagan gods demanding all sorts of weird and horrible sacrifices, they don't go along with that, right? They say, ah, if the only way the storm can go away is if we kill you, then I guess we should row harder, <laughs> which is not what you would expect them to say. Um, again, contrasting their willingness to risk themselves and their willingness to put extra effort into saving him, even though they now know he deserves everything that is happening. Mm. They are 180 degrees different than Jonah himself. And again, showing that the, the worth of these, these non-Jewish sailors in order to teach a lesson to Jonah about the worth of the people of Nineveh. And they called to the Lord, and I think that uses the name, isn't it? It does, yeah. yeah. And they called to the Lord uh, and said, Please, O Lord, let us not perish for the life of this man, and do not place upon us innocent blood for you, O Lord, as you wish you have done. And they picked up Jonah and cast him into the sea, and the sea ceased storming. And the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they made sacrifices to the Lord and made vows. Mm -hmm. uh, that made vows. That's interesting. Uh, so Jonah, as a as a prophet, has um, created converts. Of sense. I think the, the tradition precisely says that these people went and made sacrifices to Jerusalem as part of the conversion process. Um, that they they became Jews right there and then. That like just wow. Um, and that is the end of chapter one. So there we go. We haven't got to the whale bit yet. Um, oh, spoiler. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, because there's some interesting stuff to talk about with the um, with the whale, uh, especially when it gets to some of the traditions surrounding the whale. Thank you very much for um, giving us your time this afternoon. Oh, of course, one of my favorite books. And uh, you guys at home, um, the following show will be up in a couple of weeks, so keep your eyes open for that. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel. There'll also be a button on your screen about now to subscribe to Rabbi Neely's channel. He has uh, live programs going out at least two a week, so it's um, well worth um, subscribing over there and catching up with his content. And we'll all see you uh, very soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.